isn't that just the best hello gatekeepers how's everybody doing out there well maybe i shouldn't ask whole damn world's on fire but you know where it isn't right here right now right right here right now hello old souls i know it's a damn shame isn't it that young man god bless him <laughs> if you know what i'm talking about it's a young man named oliver anthony and he put out a little tune lives on a 97 acre well 97 acres i guarantee it's not uh there's not a lot on it that's probably the way he likes it lives in a trailer he bought on craigslist for 750 dollars with a tarp on top picked up a guitar decided to write down some lyrics wrote a couple songs had a little bit of youtube channel He decided to choose four chords in the truth. It's a damn shame. Rich men, North Richmond. Lord, Lord, Lord. Oh, I got a feeling. Our turn's coming. I can feel it. And that's what all these light workers are here for. That's what all these gatekeepers are here for. That's what all these old souls are gathered here tonight smiling at animals and looking at flowers burnt blooming and at the same time seeing ghosts and skeletons and everything else all mixed up just makes sense to us so if you're new here welcome absolutely welcome we've got a hot diggity dog we got ghosts tonight we got a couple of good ghost stories from somebody ought to know what he's talking about although i gotta be honest and I got to be bold and I just got to be truthful to myself and to you. Say, I don't agree with everything, but I'm listening with an open mind. I mean, you know, who's going to agree with everything somebody says, right? That's just not even normal. It wouldn't be. What kind of crazy thing would that be? But you, you got to look at the man's decades of experience. Obvious experience. He started as a small child, you know. Uh, and now I'm talking about, <laughs> talking about Peter Underwood. Who is an also an amazing person? But I'll tell you what, that Oliver Anthony, you get over there to YouTube. If you're of the mind where you've been working all, you know, overtime hours for bullshit pay and you've just had enough, it's a little bit of an anthem song. And I'll tell you what, it makes you feel good to know that you feel like you're a part of not feeling so not a part of not wanting to be but any kind of mess like that, you know? We just want our peace and our quiet and our animals and our nature and our music and our our crafts, our skill and our job and leave us alone. You know, and I think that's how the ghosts feel, too. So finish up on Oliver Anthony. The guy hit, I don't know, I'm going to throw a number out there. I feel confident about four million something on YouTube in three days. Because it resonates. All of the empaths in this chat, all the empaths listening right now, the light workers, the people with abilities, the prophetic dreamers, the uh, people that can still dream and hope through all this mess. That's the core. That's the core. That's the part that needs to keep the lights on. And we're going to do that. And uh, this kid, I call him a kid because I'm an old broad and I can do that. But this beautiful soul wrote that song, put it out there, and more souls picked it up and ran with it and floated it. And it's beautiful. It's an anthem. And if Ann Edna, I think I saw Ann Edna. If I didn't, maybe she'll hear this uh, coming up. But I know she's not the only one in here that's can remember the 60s and the 70s when, you know, Dylan would drop a, a tune or. Crosby, Stills, and Nash had put one out, and it would just hit you. But those were produced. This is a guy standing, quite literally, I believe, on a pallet, like a little pallet stage or, or close to it. Microphone. This guitar. Two dogs. Both German shepherds, one white and one black. And he wrote the truth. And people found hope in it. So if you're looking for a little hope and a little light and a little 
a little boost, a little energize after the show. Go look up Oliver Anthony. His real name is Chris. Song, I think, is number one. I think he's got the number one, the number three, and the number seven song on Billboard right now. And it all happened in like two weeks. And it shows people we got hope. But it sounds the same to me as the 60s and in the 70s, you know. And they had songs way back in the day, too, guys. You know. That's how we kept each other going way back in the day. I mean, gosh, people would sing through it. And it's going to get us out of this, too. So is the light and the light workers. We all remember we all incarnated at this time. I'm not the only one that feels that. I know that for sure because I see the name is rolling in this chat. I see you, Bobby. I see you, Chris, Renice, Vixen, Jack. Hey, Jack. How you doing? I see you, Yoda girl. I saw Lindsay in here. I see Straw Dog. How's it going, man? Chris. Chris Chris knows what I'm talking about. Everybody here. Kathleen. So good to see y'all. So really good to see y'all. But yeah, it's been a hard week for a lot of people. My heart goes out. But remember, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe a train. <laughs> don't say you weren't worried but let's hope it's hot mess express <laughs> just jump on the bar car and we'll ride it out together hey froze hey tom welcome 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 so to finish off uh this young man oh lord 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 just go listen to it pass it along if you think it might bring somebody you know it's it's kind of Take this job and shove it for our times. I remember when that song came out and there, there so many people were singing it. Even if they didn't really get it, it was it became so common that people would say it because everybody was mad at their job and didn't think the check was enough. But I remember back in the 70s, I think we, as bad as we were then, we were complaining about it too. And it was rough. And I remember when they had to even odd days here in America and, you know, lucky people that had two cars would just, <laughs> maybe it was, they got lucky and could go both days. But, you know, I remember from other sides of it, like my mom who really had to figure it out because I can remember saying I'm spending more gas in line waiting to get gas than I can. But we got through, we got through it together. And we got through it because, thank you, Froze, Johnny Paycheck. Take this job and shove it. Boom, 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 ain't working here no more. Remember that? Everybody was singing it. Even if you didn't, even if you were just, you knew you weren't going to quit. <laughs> you just wanted to get it out. Hang on, man. I'm in my wires. So anyway, this young man sings a song. And, uh. One of the lines, you're going to hear, I, I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, because if you hadn't heard it, I don't want to take it from you, where you've got that first reaction, that first feel. And again, if it's not your cup of tea, it's not your cup of tea. But this, this is shooting across all genres. It doesn't matter, you know, country or, or new country, old country, rappers, you know, what's all the music the kids are into today? You know, all, all that stuff. The hip, you know, the hippity hoppity and the, the, um, what's that, uh, dibbity dap or whatever that is. I don't know. That ravey stuff. It's like, how is it a cure for anxiety to go in there and just get more anxiety? But, you know, kids today with their hair and their music, uh, we had it too. I was rock and roll, make no mistake, but I was involved with this punk, disco. Hard rock, acid rock, real bad punk, like, you know, crazy punk, dead boys. And I like the Ramones. So anyway, I'm getting off track. This guy wrote a lyric, the, the lyrics, I mean, it's going to resonate. But the one that made me think of you guys, you know, wish I could just wake up. And it not be true, but it is. Oh, it is living in the new world. 
with an old soul. Mm. There it is. Because not everybody, even though everybody's got, I believe, an old soul. Yeah, there's a lot of new souls coming in. You can tell them, there's no mistake it. But not everybody remembers being that old soul. You feel me? A lot of people feel out of out of place. And I think that's one reason that we're all in into the miracle and the, the supernatural and paranormal and, and the, the metaphysical. Because we see it all. And we know damn well there's been a big old foot on us for a very long time to keep us from learning how powerful we are and how, how, how magical we really are. Even as much as on the same level with a rabbit that knows that the, the hawk is near. Such a simple thing. They blasted it or tried to blast it out of us, fluoride it out of us, calcify us, chemtrail us, GMO us, pharmaceutical us, confuse, distract. Living in the new world, an old soul. I love each and every one of you. And you guys are, I'm telling you, you get what I'm saying. That piece of soul that remembers. That's the uncomfortable part, but it's so powerful and it resonates with each and every one of us that just know there's something. You can feel it. But you can also feel the lights are still on. And the important part of being a part of that and that's why we're all here to remind us and 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 do it through something we enjoy like ghost stories and i've got one of the guys he had a style tonight peter underwood but like i said he had lots of decades but this kid wrote this song he means what he says he was offered an 8 million dollar contract and turned it down said i, I, I don't want to be a singer I don't, want, I don't want your money. I just want whatever this sparked to keep going. I just want whatever sparked the hearts that it resonated with to ask themselves, what are they going to do to keep that going? He said, it's not me. I'm a so-so guitar player. And I'm paraphrasing here, but I'm damn close to what he said. And you can go yourself and look at him say it on YouTube himself. And I suggest you do. Because it was a powerful message. He said, but, and he said, I'm an okay singer. My words are simple, but they're true. Turned down an $8 million contract. Nope. Just fix it. Just fix it. We're tired. An orb? I hope so. I hope it's a, a an angel, Renice. I hope it's a spirit guides. I hope it's like light workers coming in to just give you guys energy. You know what I mean? You might see some smoke too. I don't know. I got incense going and stuff and sage and all kinds of things. But anyway, it's just all 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 you know. Positive uh, is welcome. All negative has to get the hell out of here, right? So the kid walks it like he talks it. I think he's going to be an inspiration to you. And uh, it's crossing all boundaries. Uh, go look at the reaction tapes. They'll the, the tug your heartstrings. And uh, just uh, more power to them. More power to every, all the artists. We always celebrate artists and uh, crafters and creativity and music and, you know, love and storytelling and authors and people with abilities and people that think, you know, would like to strengthen their abilities. Because I'm telling you. Oh, something I thought about too, thinking back going over vampires with Ron Murphy. Now, Ron's coming back once a month. Uh, Lynn's coming back. Uh, she's feeling much better, thank God. And, um, you know, digging with both of them. I think Lynn's on next Sunday doing the other side. So, you know, save the, save the date because we're always asking that question and we're going to combined what we what we've heard and what she's seen and she's seen some new stuff and she's a powerful message so don't miss that next sunday 
But something digging on into all this with Ron Murphy, too, and then we'll get to Peter Underwood. I've really been digging in depth. That's why, just like all the other stuff, and I say this a hundred times, any true crime or Lizzie Borden or Lincoln or Donald case, whatever it may be, you dig all the way to the back in the beginning, get 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 in front of it, and then you, you rip it. You know, you just rip it with research and and turn it inside out and verify and verify again, and then you have to sort it and then you have to run it through your filters. Well, hell, that's like life. Or you should be doing it, yeah? Living in a new world, Bobby. Well, I got news. <laughs> I'm telling you. Mm. Spiritual warfare. I'm telling you, it's it's uh it's it's wild. And I want to keep my channel, so I'm I'm trying real hard. I'm like I'm gripping my teeth and I'm I mean, I'm telling you, it's not easy, but you know what? It's not for everybody that sees it. You can't unsee it, right? And who, who wants to? So like I said, in all the videos I do and everything else and the Zen and oh, don't forget to, to help yourself and, you know, whatever it may be. Running or whatever you do, meditation, listen to high frequency music, even if it's just for a few minutes, listen to a, a a guided meditation for five minutes on your phone. Get one of those apps, download one of those apps. They're really good. Those things are really cool because they they um they move with you, they grow with you, they stay at your pace. Does that make sense? You know, thank you, Straw Dog. Yeah, Bobby, I'm telling you. You know, <laughs> I could just go off and sing that whole song from the, from from my soul, you know, right now. I could. I mean, um, I just get so proud of people that just they go for it. They put it out there. And once you put that kind of stuff in the universe, the universe can work with it. And positivity and light workers that are focusing on it with the right intent, you know what I'm saying, can move things, can change things. We got to give it some light to work with, right? It's not easy. It's not easy, but find something positive to focus on. You know, even if it's a, if it's if it's you know your cat or your dog, your grandkid or your you know a loved one or uh, I don't care if it's binge watching a show that makes you feel empowers you or whatever. You know, some people have to go down to come back up. Some people, that's why people like to watch movies that make them cry. I hate that shit. Show me stuff blowing up. It makes me feel a lot better. I mean, it's just, I'm just wired that way. I can't help it. You know, all that mushy, what do you call that? Lifetime movie stuff. Mother, my, mother can I sleep with danger? And she's like, honey, girl, I got enough problems. You go sleep with danger. Keep them occupied. And we're going to go up here and do something decent with my day. You know, that's crazy stuff. It's, it's, what do you call it? Um. Uh, it's like, I was going to say it's like mouthwash, but brainwash. That does, that's funny. Yeah, it's brainwashing. It's propaganda, psyop, whatever you want to say. It, it's busy work for your brain. It just upset everybody. And all those soap operas make everybody feel like that's the way my life's supposed to be. I'm just supposed to go out to the restaurant for breakfast and meet somebody over at the hospital. Then shoot over to the office because we can't call and ask somebody we have to get in the car and go all the way across town and change our outfit on the way and then once i get there i'm gonna tell them how our dying love and before it's over we're gonna break up but we're gonna meet over at the on the boat or the or whatever the heart surgeon or it's crazy shit but it's been going on forever it's a distraction and it's also makes you to feel supposed to make you feel less than like you're not doing enough that's what I, I hated about stuff like the Don Reeds and things like that. These women uh, had all these perfect houses and the, the dad went home and the, the three and a half kids would be running around all perfect and getting A's in school and bouncing around with their little ponytails and their bobby socks. And, you know, nobody was like arguing and throwing stuff in the living room or <laughs> getting, you know. It tried to show you, I think, though, it had morals and it tried to show you right from wrong. 
but for a lot of people, some things just made them feel like they weren't doing it right. Like the covers of magazines and things like that. And then you get anorexia and all that. And that pendulum swung this way, didn't it? I'm telling you. We went right past straight past Twiggy and didn't stop at the Renaissance with nice curvy wide hips and all that stuff. We went straight into baby elephant walk and stuff. I mean, and that's just, it's, it's fine. Whatever you are, I'm not skinny. I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not putting down. But when you put it, people up there, the very extreme skinny is not healthy and neither is the other. And our kids have no clue. I don't think it was healthy for them to wait, you know, around Barbie either with the a waist that was what? In proportion. And making people feel less than and the men too. I think the men are really getting it now too. God, I'm talking about this shit, ain't I? But anyway, and we need to stop that. You know. Character. One at a time. Not by the group. Just like with ghosts. Because ghosts were people too. It makes sense. And like I said, looking back with Ron Murphy. Digging for vampires. and Going all the way back to early primal. People running around. Good tribes, bad tribes. Good villages, bad villages. People hunting people. Bats coming out of caves. Monsters living in the cave. That made a lot of sense to me. And I started digging too. Again, it's not the same as Dracula. This immortal being that, you know, changes into bats and wolves and all that kind of stuff. It's two separate things. Just like I think it's separate from werewolf and dogman. I'm no expert. When I wrote Cabin 22, I had to reach out to people I knew and ask them a question. I didn't want it to them to tell me too much because I didn't want them to navigate a story or put their story in my head. I asked them a question. In a situation like this, if this and this was happening with these characteristics and these, you know, would this or this happen? Which would be more likely? I would ask questions like that. But there was stuff that I wrote in Cabin 22 that's turning out to be, I wasn't far off and I had no idea about dog, a, a dog man. I knew more about Bigfoot. Not that I know a lot of it. Just saying, I knew more. That was kind of outside the box for me. But I had a feeling. Because I figured everything seems to be telepathic. Think about it. aliens, spirit. Even some earthbound ghosts. Are you guys picking up what I'm putting down here? Everything's telepathic. And it turns out we're definitely going to get Ron in here and we're going to ask him. But I guarantee we're doing Bigfoot with him uh, next month. I'm going to touch on this because a lot of these dogmen, more dogmen, not so much the werewolf thing. Again, think of that separately. But the dogman, Rugaru. Right? Right, Renice? You wondered that too? Shake and bake by Are we vacuuming? Who's cleaning the house right now? Show of hands. High heels. Yeah, doing housework and high heels. This is what I'm saying, Vixen Doe, Donna Reed. Uh, you, you know, the hair was done, you know, and had right there with the answers. I have the you just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> and of course they had that whole you know i don't even want to get into the whole woman, uh, rise of the woman and all that stuff look i'm for it and i mean everybody's got to handle their own thing lord knows i did i was no donna reed but i was a great mom best i could barefoot uphill both ways in the snow dragging them kicking and screaming every inch of the way <laughs> You know, so I said, uh, you know, and, and hard. I mean, if you don't have a lot of money and a lot of this, and a lot of that, and you got to hack it out of the wilderness, basically, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Crazy. 
and do it, having to do it in high heels. I look back at those women and I think they're wonderful. I saw my mama do it. She went to the office. To, I have pictures of her working in floral design doing what I do now on a hard floor in a, in a dress and, in a, a dress and heels. And her hair was fabulous. You know what I mean? And I dragged my old butt out of bed, throw on jeans and a t-shirt and some comfortable, <laughs> sensible shoes. <laughs> and I go, and with a podcast, you know, or something, audiobook or something in my head, just pound out flowers. And she did it in heels, just like Ginger Rogers. So, mass kudos. But I think everything, like I said, I'm really, 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 it's getting solidified on this whole telepathic everything connected, everything can, do you have any idea how many stories are out there about Bigfoot communicating telepathically with people? We touched on it in cabin 22. I offered it up as a suggestion. Of course that's fiction, but a lot of it's true in that book. Lindsay can verify that. Vixen's read it. Haven't you Vixen? Renice, have you heard cabin 22 yet? I'm sorry, I can't remember if you were there last Halloween. We all listened to it. Or or you may have listened to it after you went in and maybe the playlist. I can't remember. I think so. But anyway, that's what I'm saying, right, Lindsay? So it, it's tripping me out. And, I, and I'm just telling you about it now because I've been thinking about Cabin 22. I'm writing it. I'm putting it in print. It's coming along well. And, uh. The rats, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I I go through that whole chapter and I'm like, I'm, that's a good chapter. I'd like I hardly remember writing it, but I do remember it. I, I, I'm with Steve. I had help. There was a spirit here. Somebody was here helping. Probably Jeb and Skeet sitting right next to me, whispering stuff in my ears. And just as long as old Ezra never showed up. Ooh, God, man, that gave me chills. Let's hope not. We always like to think, oh, wouldn't that be neat? Yeah. What kind of spirits sit next to you telling you what to write? You, you, you think about it. Go either way, right? I guess you'd feel it. Well, God, let's hope so, right? It's fun, right, Lizzie? I still cry with Jacob in the cave. I still cry with Jacob in the cave. I know what's coming. I know what's going to happen. And I still start, I just... I still do. And his voice, I still don't know where his voice came from. Wow. Anyway, I think it's all connected in, in so many ways. And then I think about how hard they have tried over the decades, little by little, slow boiling of the frog. People started screaming all kinds of things, you know, Everybody's crazy until you're not. And, you know, and nobody realizes how much you wish that it wasn't true. You know, I had to tell people at work the other day, somebody got real upset. She came by and she said something. And I'm no longer fit for company, I assure you, on most days. On a good day, I can keep my mouth shut and just listen to my thing and pound out a lot of work and go home for bullshit pay. <laughs> anyway, we all do. And she came by and she said something just so, it, it was equal to, Oswald did it all by himself. Something, it's that wasn't it, but it was something close to it. Today's equal to me as far as reaction. And level of what? And that monster we talk about where you just want to come out and say something. Explain to me how physics. Do you know what I mean? Bobby, you know what I'm saying. And I just looked at my boss and I went, you have no idea <laughs> how hard. You know, and you just got to
and you know and you have known and there's no glee in being you know nobody wants to like i said but it's but it is and i think how hard they over the decades they've tried to keep your Oh, they're going to put fluoride in the water for this. And you wind up calcifying your pineal gland. We're struggling to open our third eye, struggling to hone our senses and our abilities and just trying to the intuition and following intuition. And, you know, pe some people have, you know, one direction that they've worked with, like these fantastic psychics that work with police and try to find miss. I don't care how many times I try to tell people, they'll say, well, psychics are so good. So good why don't they find missing bodies? Do you have any idea how many body, body psychics have found? Shut up. I am so tired of wrong. You know, I don't mind ignorance, but willful, willful ignorance is something completely different. When you've got stone cold facts in front of your face and you don't see it, You're like a speed bump. Do you feel what I'm saying? Just don't get your peanut butter or my chocolate. Go over there and play with some Legos or something. I got adulting to do over here. We got a freaking world to save. And we're going to freaking do it. And it all starts with understanding it's all connected. Even the freaking dog man is telepathic. We had to work on ours. Why not? We probably did. And it was stamped out, quieted, hidden from us. And certain people, it's just crying to get out. And it might be that they see dead people or they hear things or they have prophetic dreams. Or they feel, see things when they touch something, they'll get visions. Or the dead speak to them just dying. No pun intended, really, to speak to a loved one and tell them that one little thing. And I still can't wrap my head around how even, and I do it too, how we can sit here an entire lifetime and have all this communication device and still not say what we wanted to say to the people we wanted to say it to. I've tried to rectify that. But here lately, it hadn't been easy. Thank you, Froze. He's picking up what I'm putting down. I feel you, baby. It's a damn shame. <laughs> you know what? Usually when it gets to this point, songs like that start coming out and people start moving their butts and doing things locally and finding alternative ways to, well, shoot, I can't, get, I can't afford to get that truck fixed, but I got a whole garden full of tomatoes and, you know, I can can or somebody in the house can can or I can do it together. And old Jack over there, I can invite him over. He was saying he wished he had a garden and missed his tomatoes last year. Trade. Trade. Help him fix his roof. Some other kind of mess. It's way, hey. Grandpa and grandma got to live like that. And it helps. You might not have to do all of it all the time, but it helps a little side like that. And keep singing. Keep singing songs like that. Rich man. North of Richmond. Listen to me. There's not a person in here that's lived rich high on the hog floating on your yacht, going from concert to concert, Milan to where, whatever, casino to casino, flying in your private jet. Not one of you. That's a given. The higher they climb, baby. What did mom always say? The harder they fall. Way down they go, 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 go. 
go. How about some ghost stories? This little thing right here. Now, this gentleman, he's a cheeky little monkey. He is absolutely the epitome of an English gentleman. He is careful with his words. Snazzy dresser. He started off, <laughs> and I say some of this tug in cheek, but I mean it too. You know what I mean? I have nothing but respect for people like him. Um, Harry Price, as goofy as he was, God bless him, he came up with some stuff, right? There you go. Go ahead, Lindsay. I'm telling you what. Dude, kick it in. Kick it in. You know, so. Who knows how to sew on buttons? You know? <laughs> they got you. To, they got a bunch of people to buy some dry cleaning that you can't even hand wash. And I mean, I'm telling you. Those hard people. You know, it, it, there's a lot of truth to a country boy who can't survive. People have been doing it for themselves all along. We go, shit, what was that? You know? Like the Amish were other people that sit all day long. <laughs> I watch this all, all the time because there's one right across the street. Bitching about the gas and how expensive things are. But they just went and got their hair done and do it every week. Listen, honey, I'm in Jersey. I'm in Jersey Shore. And if you don't know what that means... You will have your hair done, your nails done, your toes done, right? Every week. Probably more. <laughs> but part of that comes with you bitch about how you can't pay, afford to pay your bills while you're having doing all this stuff. And again, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not saying don't get, I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a type. And then they get in a car and a huge, more car than, again, just think about it. And sit at the Starbucks with an empty parking lot, nobody in the store. Sit in the drive-thru at the Starbucks and pay eight fifty dollars for a cake pop. And God knows what for a coffee that doesn't, have, doesn't even look like, resemble any coffee I've ever, you know. And you go right across the street to the Wild Wild and get one just as good for a quarter of the price. And then they come into the florist and bitch about how they don't want to pay for, you know, flowers because they don't have any money. Bills are too high. The, are they everywhere? Lizzie, you got them in Canada. Oh, God bless us all, everyone. I just laugh, you know. And I think you'd be hard-pressed line everybody up and find half a dozen in a hundred that could do a quarter of what your grandpa and your grandpa pa did to survive back in the day and what a lot of people are doing right now so like i said we're warriors and survivors here and there was an awful lot back in the day when peter underwood was just starting out too and being in london well in the uk there, it, it, it's, it's funny to look back tonight. We're going to look at some stuff from 1975 and it's funny to think of where I was in 1975 and then looking at what was going on in the UK and around the world. We didn't see a lot of that, you know, we didn't have like ghost stories from, you know, actually out of Britain and things like that. That's um, relatively new, you know, eighties, nineties up. Because I'm talking early, late 60s, early 70s. That's when all like your early Bigfoot stories with Peter Graves and stuff was coming out. Chariots of the Gods. Um, what was the other one? Chariots of the Gods and something else. Help me out, chat. So he was doing the same type of thing as Hans Holzler was doing here. In the United States, and of course, he was, you know, um, where was he from? It wasn't Argentina, was it? But he was doing his thing here in the United States. 
I believe he went back and forth to Switzerland a couple times. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's where it was. Hans Hosler, that is. And then looking over at the same time and seeing what Peter Underwood was up to. Now, this man is going to tell you a little bit in a little video I have here. He grew up in Rose Hall. Haunted place. Switzerland. Thank you, Froze. And uh, Bobby. I'm trying to see. God, I get to get new glasses. And uh, I know, honey, it's it's rough, straw dog. So to see his tactics and what was going on there, and it's so funny because it's very much like Charles Dickens, the Chad, the um, Pickwick Papers, where all the the um, guys got together and they're all those wonderful characters that uh, Charles Dickens put together and tell their ghost stories, yeah. And it was a gentleman's club and it was very proper in a lot of ways. And, you know, uh, just different. It's just different because that's certainly, you know, those things certainly weren't really going on here. Our gentleman's club in, Amer in America at that time, it's something totally different. You know, we're talking about the seventies in, in America, you know, at least in the cities where I was, I was in Jersey and New York. So, it's very quaint to see and, and to try to respect a place and a vantage point he's coming from that I'm not quite used to, but I'm trying to understand by going back over his stuff. And I've done that re just recently, the past three years. And Harry Price and digging into them and understanding what the whole ghost club was. And I have a little bit of that in here, too. 18, I want to say 82, 92. Again, I've got the correct date here. Just off the top of my head. It's going back. And Harry Price, again, he had his stuff. We did a big show on him. I think last year around this time. And he came up with all these little gadgets and whatnots and things. And, you know, people said he made stuff up and he embellished things. And he was theatrical, you know, but. You know, so was Barnum and Bailey. So was Ripley's Believe It or Not. So was everything. It was entertaining magicians and pulling rabbits out of hats and whatnot. It was a it was a happy distraction, just like movies and everything else. But there was some serious things, on purpose or not, some actual things that happened around Harry Price. And if you throw the whole baby out with the bathwater, you're going to miss that, because that's evidence and that's knowledge. That came out of a very unique situation in Harry Price's world. Borley Mansion. Being able to rent Borley Mansion. If you don't know the story, we got a great episode on that whole thing. And a whole one I did with Steve Stockton on uh, Borley Mansion. And that whole story. And it, you're going to hear some of that tonight too. Because Peter Underwood then got involved. And he came along almost two generations from that and growing up in Rose Hall it was his job as a, a little boy to introduce like party guests that would come over and you know friends of his parents and stuff like that he got to show them the haunted rooms and tell them the stories of the ghosts that they had in that house and that's what sparked his interest and he then saw his father who had passed the day he passed standing by his bed and the rest was history. And he became the president of this ghost club, 1948, Harry Price passed and Peter Underwood kind of was in the, it was in the ghost club and kind of stood up and revived it and wanted to do a whole new investigation not completely debunking everything Harry Price and his crew had done because he got to rent, I think, for a year and uh, be in there to, you know, keep everything, journalize everything that happened and do some experience, experiments with some volunteers from a couple of the colleges around. And, of course, 
lots of pomp and circumstance, lots of advertising, lots of made a big deal out of it. And as well, he should have. He had fun with it, right? And then walked in Peter Underwood. And again, I try to think about his vantage point on things. And he said something along the lines where he thought only 98%. No, wait a minute. 98% of a lot of the things he investigated turned out to be what he would not consider a ghost. 2% would come up that he could actually almost not quite replicate with science or have it re repeat. And even those things he couldn't say were really ghosts. In fact, in here, you're going to hear him say, I'm trying to remember exactly how he said it. that I believe he says that ghosts aren't necessarily proof of afterlife. I'm paraphrasing. But are more like echoes of someone who once was. Someone who lived here before. So I wonder if he was here now. He he did pass that long ago. I believe it was in the past like 20 years. I think it was 2014. Again, I have that here. But I wonder what he would say now, given a lot of evidence or something like that. It, I almost hope that he didn't go before learning how much communication people have been having. What did he think of, you know... It's um, you know, there's just too much, and I would have loved to have been able to pick his brain as I would have liked to with Hans Holzer. Was also very careful. He wasn't quick to jump to conclusion, but you know, he did sit on the bed with Ethel Myers and just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the ghost, and he's just like, he he would never say that he didn't think they existed, but he was very careful about. Not just falling for anything. But he had good people and good equipment and good tools, basically. And his own. So, when you hear Peter Underwood say things like that, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, reading some of his books, and there's quite a few, listening to his ghost stories, and I have a few for you tonight, and hearing some of his interviews as he got older, he kind of came up off of that a little. But I believe that during the time when he was part of this gentleman's club, kind of, like I said, think Pickwick Papers. And I'm trying to think of another scene. There's been so many, none stick out. But just think that very English library you know, brandy and cigar kind of deal where somebody's standing up with his hand on the mantle telling a story and then everybody's going to pick it apart and somebody's going to, there's so many great haunted stories that are, that start with that too. What's a great premise for a book. And I know there's been many stories done like that, but, and then the next guy tells a story or gives his opinion or tells a story of whatever ghost or whatever it may be. And uh, I don't think he he wanted to lay everything on the table. I think he wanted to be respected and should have been. Uh, he was a parapsychologist. So once you get that, everything is scientifically, you know, we're double checking everything. And of course, that's what all of us who investigate do now. You're going to lift the table. You're going to look under it. You're going to see, if, was there enough wind to knock the table over? Or what did it scoot across the floor on its own? Or was there a draft? I love that. Don't you love that when, you know, some big over, over, <laughs> over stuffed chair flips over and somebody goes, is there a draft? Is there a window open? You know, crazy. So anyway, when you're listening to him in this, this stage of his life, which is some of the film you're going to see. Think about how, where he's coming from and what he's surrounded by. And I wonder if he's not trying to get a full thought across without it being so 
What's the word I'm looking for? Final, finite. Where he's saying, yo, man, this place haunted. You know what I mean? He had to go in there with his turtleneck and his tweed jacket and, you know, play it a little close to the, uh, the vest there because he had a reputation. But if you read his books and the explanation he gives in individual cases, he tells the story. He speaks of the ghost. He speaks of the ghost as a, I, I almost said living, breathing thing, but you get my point. That's almost, that's especially the ones that are intelligent and have intelligent reaction. Oh, did he? Uh, was that a uh, Von Donegan or, um, no, did he do? He did chariots of the gods, didn't he? There's a couple of them, and you know we might get to get a chance to watch. Would you guys like to watch that? We could do a watch party because I think that I think they're uh, it's public domain now. So anyway, back to Harry. So all that's what I'm saying. If you look at him from that from that view, and think about it that way. And then pick up one of his books. There's many. And just like Hans Holzer, they're spread out. So if you're like into hypnosis or astrology or, you know, you know what I mean? Different things, different paths and venues, more focused ones where he's got a whole one in, on Borley um, Rectory. And he's got the companion one he wrote later in life. And I wonder how that differs. I haven't read both. Um, just ghosts, ghosts of a specific place like Cornwall and many other things and pick his brain because there's so, there's a lot of decades in this subject for that man. He lived a good long life and he tells a good ghost story, but you can tell the way he tells the ghost story. He's very, now where's my people from across the pond tonight because there's a word for it and I don't I don't want to keep saying proper because it's deeper than that it's it there's a um he's almost when he tells the stories even when he's speaking about emotion it doesn't you're not hearing the emotion in his voice. He's almost very officer-like. Or I almost said prison warden. <laughs> That's going too far. Erase that. Bring that back a little bit. It's more, well, you'll see. All right. So here's, um, we'll talk about it as we go. So just to wet your whistle, okay, I put this little ditty together, and now this is some information on the man we're going to talk about tonight that we're honoring tonight, Peter Underwood. And uh, we should do, should we do what that basket of crackers was doing last week with uh oh who was it Saint Germain Saint Germain Saint Germain Saint no no I can't imagine I guess rock concerts could be like that too. I wonder if they, you know, if anybody would ever slip in something in a rock concert where somebody was playing something and even the band might not even know it, but had a little something in it and got everybody to do that at the same time. Would that Could that possibly work out to be a spell? I don't know. I'm asking for a friend. Do you think that's possible? If somebody had told me that when I was a teenager and they did. I think at that time I reacted to that whole thing. Well, go ahead and censor it because it'll just sell more, you know. But you, sometimes you go and you feel it and you remove yourself and you go, wait a minute, something, something's up, you know. But I never felt it at the concerts they thought you should feel it at. It was other stuff. I never, I've been to many ACDC concerts and I never felt bad in one of them. Pretty drunk in one. All right, two. But never felt like bad vibes. Well, wait a minute. I take that back because there was one where White Snake open for them and they got booed off a of stage and there was some bottle throwing going on but it was at the stage and not among the people it was it, actually the people were in agreement you know and i believe i heard him saying something like um 
Channing just, oh gosh, what was it? Oh, Angus, Angus. <laughs> it wasn't me. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I was too drunk to, to throw vodka that night. I had had it. That was crazy. And I should not have worn those heels. I was wearing some boots I probably shouldn't have been wearing. But anyway, that's not paranormal. That's just scary. <laughs> Told you. No more uh, Donna Reed heels for me. God bless you. Uh, all those women that could do that, including my mom. So here we go. Just a couple of his books and a little bit about Peter Underwood. <sighs> Two thousand fourteen. Thanks, Lindsay. Yep. He's a handsome old fellow, wasn't he? I love this picture of him because he's, he's after it. You know what I mean? You see it in his eyes. He's going after that ghost. Go right up them stairs. Thirty-three years. Thirty-three years. And there he is who's getting started. See what I mean? See what I mean? Bless his heart. I'll tell you what, that was me my whole whole life. I hope there wasn't something coming out of the crate like that, though. Look at these books. So I put this in here. So if you're interested in digging into a, somebody who spent 30 years, you know, and before that, I mean, they're just counting the time he was in Ghost Club. The Ghost Club. It's his whole life. Pick a book. You know, go back and, and look at the replay and go back over that list and find something that might interest you. And just... Give it a whirl and see what he has to say because this is back in the day when people wrote their books. They didn't get ghost writers. And just like with Hans Holzler, there's a lot of knowledge there. A lot of knowledge. Look at this. Even on Karloff, Maryland. Ghostport, that's one of the most famous ones. Jack the Ripper, he was just obsessed with that. I'd, it might be interesting to see what he thought about that, what his conclusions were. That's an undertaking right there. ghost hunting might be worth it for paranormal investigators dig into it yep there he is thinking about it 
bless his heart. 70 years. Good for him. Good for him. It's not easy to do. There you go. That's a little bit about Peter. And I'll tell you what, 70 years, right? So the guy's got something in this field to teach. That's why I went ahead and listed all those books. Like I said, go in there, find one, maybe look on, you know, the, the old used paperbacks or whatever and go over it and, and see what you can pull out of there, you know, for your knowledge, for your recharge and your, your abilities or what your interest uh, is, even if you're just trying to answer some questions or you want some good ghost stories that are just really going to chill you to the bone, because I'm telling you, that is a, he's pulling from a vat of uh, possibilities where he lived and all the time he spent there. I mean, uh, it's, it's a really trip. It's a trip. And he's one of the few, people that wrote the book on Borley that actually got to speak to the, some of the individuals that were involved in the stories, you know? So that's even more invaluable, right? So the, like I said, the way he told stories, let me see which one this is. Do, 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 do. I think it is. Let's listen to one of his stories and that'll take you back to 1975 kind of go backwards a little bit but um i want you to hear one of his little ghost stories he's he did a radio show i don't know how frequent it was i don't know if it was once a week or whatever but uh there's a few out there that you can get a hold of i believe you can through um check your local library i know people don't think about doing that much but it's a wealth of free stuff nobody's got money but i'll tell you what i homeschooled and just keeping entertained and, and stuff like that local library sometimes depending on where we lived i would go get tapes and movies and books and you know all kind of uh, study stuff go in there and get you some free movies and cds to put in your meditation stuff or whatever you don't have to spend money you know, if you can get to the library, go utilize it. It's one of the few free things that are still out there. They're actually free. They're actually worth do doing. You know what I mean? Other than nature and stuff like that. So look into that and see if you can get one of his books. But here's one of his ghost stories done in his own voice. And this was, again, most of the 80s. I don't know all the exact dates from when to when. But uh, they're really good. And we've heard a couple on this. Uh, I believe I have that one tonight, too. It's my favorite voices. We listened to it last year when we were doing uh, Borley and Harry Price. And we focused more on Harry Price. But uh, I think you're going to like it. Here we go. In October 1693, Sir Tristram and Lady Beresford were visiting Dublin. One morning, Lady Beresford came downstairs, seeming agitated and disturbed. 
her husband asked after her health, and then questioned her about her wrist, which he noticed was bound with a black ribbon. Lady Beresford begged Sir Tristram not to question her about the ribbon, but said, you will never see me without it. That morning she had had a premonition that her friend, Lord Tyrone, was dead, that he died in fact on the previous Tuesday. And sure enough, confirmation arrived that day. Lord Tyrone had indeed died on the previous Tuesday. For the rest of her life, Lady Beresford was never seen without the black ribbon on her wrist. And it was not until she was on her deathbed that she related the reason to her children. On the morning that Sir Tristram had questioned her, she had suddenly found herself wide awake. Sitting beside her bed, she saw her friend, Lord Tyrone, who told her of his death. She asked for some convincing sign that she was not dreaming, whereupon he hooked up the bed hangings in an unusual manner and wrote his signature in her pocketbook. Lady Beresford was still not convinced and asked for more proof. Then Lord Tyrone placed his hand, which was as cold as marble, on her wrist for a second and immediately the sinews shrank and withered at the touch. Lady Beresford wore the black ribbon round her wrist to hide the withered skin. She instructed her children, after her death, to unbind the ribbon and look at her wrist. When they did so, they discovered their mother's wrist was as she had described. Lady Elizabeth Cobb, the granddaughter of Lady Beresford, preserved both the ribbon and the ghostly signature at her home in Bath for many years. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on the Ghost Watch soon. Ghost Watch. Let's do one more. This is the Black Ribbon, man. There was this ghost story going around when I was in high school. But it was a yellow ribbon. It was tied around the chick's, the ghost's neck. And when you untied her, her head fell off. I never understood that. I went through, I don't know, I think it was freshman year. With thinking about that stupid story. And how, how silly it was that people believed it. And how a ribbon could hold somebody's head on. Just didn't make any sense. And I thought when I heard this that her hand was going to fall off. But it was something even worse, right? Something else. One more. They're good. Among the hundreds of ancient and haunted houses in England, 12th century Beely Abbey in Essex is especially full of atmosphere. In particular, the haunted room with its enormous four-poster made for James I, its massive furniture, heavy oak beams and dark corners. It is reputed to be haunted by the ghost of Sir John Gate, once the owner of Beely Abbey. He may have entertained Lady Jane Grey there. At all events, he was beheaded on Tower Green because of his involvement with the Nine Days Queen. His ghost still walks, it is said, each 22nd of August, the anniversary of his death in 1553. The house has been owned for years now by the Foyle family, and some years ago, Christina Foyle decided she would sleep in the haunted room despite the fact that it had not been used for over 50 years. She did so and told me of her harrowing, never to be forgotten experience. All went well until about three o'clock in the morning when Christina woke. The room was vibrating. Everything seemed to be shuddering and even the water jug spilled over. It was no dream or imagination. It was all really happening. When Christina pulled herself together, she eventually got out of bed and looked in the mirror. She discovered that she had two red tooth marks on her shoulder near the neck and another two on her fingers. When a doctor saw the wounds, slight as they were, he suggested she lost no time in going to hospital. There she had a minor operation and was told that her finger had been affected by a germ unknown for 20 years. The haunted room is empty now, and Christina Foyle tells me she will never sleep in it again, nor will she let anyone else. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. I'm Peter Underwood, and I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. <laughs> Isn't that great? So, you got to think twice about sleeping in an old bed? You know? 
but the way he talks about it, they think, okay, well, the room was closed up for that amount of time. Was there some kind of bacteria or mold or gosh, like a germ or something along those lines? So it would have to be something that could survive for that amount of time on its own without not have to be parasitic to a human, but maybe to a rat or a mouse or something along those lines. Who knows, right? Figure, yeah, sort that. But something survived, or was it supernatural? Either some kind of bacteria from back in the day that they weren't immune to anymore was released when they went in that bedroom. There was something supernatural going on. Fumigated. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to need a little more than just letting some new air in by opening the windows, right? Closed it right back up again. Wouldn't let anybody else sleep there either. But the way he says it, and you're lulled, the, the um, how do you say it, the art of telling a story and lulling you into this, you know, she goes to the doctor, she goes back and finds out she's got some kind of like, you know, leprosy or something that, you know, nobody had seen for decades, <laughs> and then all of a sudden just pops up. But it's creepy the way he tells it. And it's the art of telling the story. And it's the lore. And it's the come with me, said the spiders and the fly kind of thing. You know, it's, it's wonderful. And again, 70 years in the paranormal, you know, something else. He's, 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 he's a pistol. Okay, here, you want to do another one? Here we go. Here we go. One more. What's this one? What's this one? On 13th of February, 1748, a schooner, the Lady Lovibond, sailed down the Thames bound for Oporto. Captain Simon Reed and his new wife, together with other guests, were making merry in the captain's cabin. But up on deck, first mate John Rivers nursed his hatred and jealousy, for he had been a rival for the affections of the captain's beautiful wife. His morbid no, thoughts not. precipitated an action that is renowned. For John Rivers casually picked up a belaying pin and shattered the helmsman's skull. Unnoticed, he took the helm himself and swung the Lady Lovey Bond over. With a grinding crash, the schooner hit the Goodwin Sands. The masts snapped and toppled into the sea. The timbers split like matchwood. And amid the din, the doom ship rang with the mad laughter of the unrequited suitor, John Rivers. By first light, on the 14th of February, 1748, the Lady Lovey Bond and all aboard had been sucked into the Goodwin Sands forever. Or had she? Fifty years later, to the day, Captain James Westlake, aboard the coasting vessel Edenbridge, was skirting the Goodwins when he caught sight of a three-masted schooner bearing down on him with sails set. As the ship passed close by, he heard female laughter and other sounds of merrymaking. On the same day, the crew of a fishing vessel told how they saw a similar vessel break up before their eyes. But when they went to the rescue, they discovered nothing but empty sand and water. And every 50 years since 1748, the ghostly Lady Lovibond has been seen re-enacting her last minutes on the Goodwin Sands. She was seen from Deal in 1848 and again in 1898. In 1948, an Italian vessel reported seeing the ghost ship before she herself was wrecked on the treacherous sands. And the next sighting should be in 1998, when researchers with sophisticated equipment will attempt to record for all time the sight and sound of the tragic event which happened so long ago. This is Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Isn't he fantastic? I mean, look what she did. You get all jealous he didn't get his little monster under control. I thought it'd be a good idea to crack this guy's skull. The whole boat winds up just being, you know, scuttled, gone. Everybody dies. And then he's laughing about it. Crazy. But it's scary. Just hearing that. Can you imagine? You can, all right. 
imagine if you will and i can think of this very easy because i spent in my younger days i spent a lot of time on the beach here in new jersey certainly wouldn't do it now they ruined everything it just ruined everything it's time to you know fix it back but anyway so can you imagine you're walking along the beach and all you hear is you know just the the sound of the waves you know crashing on the shore slow you know it's nothing like crazy not even gulls because they're asleep they're off they're doing their thing you might hear a squeak here or there they hear it go come in the waves come in and go back out it's very you know very soothing it can be and uh depends on your perspective where you're standing and you're walking along and all you hear is this laughter like that and you're by yourself or even with somebody I mean, what difference does it make and you hear that laughter and it sounds like it's coming from everywhere and all around you you know what's the matter jack what'd you do electronic voice phenomenon that's right why are you saying you're sorry what'd you do jack wait a minute hold on pull the podcast over what's going on i'm joking it's so hard i'm telling you guys if you've never worn bifocals i have to do a whole great big thing and move back here to clearly see the whole chat no matter how big i make it and I, I miss some stuff sometimes because i'm trying to remember what what i wanted to tell you and then i'm trying to catch on to conversation in here too it, it's hard and i miss some stuff sometimes then i catch something i'm like okay what's going on everything cool so this guy um i think he did a good job and i i can imagine how many of these are out there i highly recommend going and look at youtube rumble um bit shoot whatever odyssey and see if you can find some old radio uh interviews that he did he throws down a lot of knowledge and he tosses in you know the story as well and um he does it just like this so let's do the last i think there's two more you guys game you hear two more I'm sure you do Ghosts. Are we all good? Serious psychical researchers always hope to obtain proof of the supernatural, either on camera or tape. Such proof was obtained from the old Bircham Newton RAF station. When I looked into the story, I discovered that the sounds of disembodied footsteps had been heard in the viewing gallery, and a heavy sigh had not only been heard, but recorded there were other unexplained events too the figure of a man in RAF uniform there you which go, vanished Reese. as one witness watched he fled one summer evening this witness returned to Bircham Newton with a friend they found the place deserted but extremely cold and rather frightening they placed recording apparatus on the floor of the building set it running and left staying within sight of the only door to the building 25 minutes later they returned they had not heard a single sound but the recording held sounds of an aircraft flying overhead muffled voices and what seemed to be heavy objects being dragged across the floor following exhaustive research and investigation we discovered that the appearance of the ghost airman had been seen on a number of occasions and sometimes he'd walked through a wall a wall built after the Second World War. We discovered that an Anson had crashed at Bircham Newton, killing the three occupants who had been based at the airfield. The crash was not reported at the time. It's thought that the ghostly airman was trying to draw attention to the crash which happened in the war. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghostwatch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghostwatch. You may have heard of Christiana Brand, the writer of thriller stories and children's books. I first met her at a literary dinner when she told me of her one and only experience of a ghost, an unusual one, a ghost dog. 
Her first job as a governess, straight Love from school, this. was to look after two small children at Weybridge. Their mother was marrying again and sent the children to stay with an aunt and uncle they had not met before. Christiana, of course, knew nothing about the family. After the children were in bed on the first evening, she joined the family for dinner. All seemed normal. The aunt at one end of the table, the uncle at the other, with what Christiana described to me as a big, curly-haired, lovable old Airedale lying at his master's feet. Sadly, the next morning, Christiana was woken with the news that the children's uncle had died suddenly during the night. A year later, she mentioned the dog to the aunt's son. What happened to your Airedale? And went on to describe the contented scene on his father's last night. And as she told me, she was surprised and puzzled to discover that although the family had owned an Airedale, exactly as she had seen, the dog had died three years before her visit to the aunt and uncle. Christiana could not explain how she'd seen the dog that night, but as she said, so many people all down the ages have claimed to see ghosts that I don't see how we can entirely disbelieve. Perhaps it's as a famous priest once said, if we do brush against the curtain of death, it's presumptuous to think it has anything to do with us. It's an accident. I'm Peter Underwood. Goodbye. Is that not fantastic? Did you hear what he said? I love that. I mean, these things, it's, it, it's so funny because all of us have come up in whatever it is, again, that we're interested in, our genre. Whether you started off in astrology and joked around as a kid and then really learned about it. And I, I, I love people who understand astrology and I'd love to learn it all. But it's a lifetime of study, you know, and I, I, I don't think everybody is supposed to do everything because I believe we're all supposed to come together, you know, almost like a tribe and sort it together as a group, because I believe it takes a group, which is, again, in cabin, cabin 22, it's that's in there, too. Because to, when we come together, we have that strength. You, you know what I mean? So everybody's supposed to go off and learn their their thing and then we come together and just kind of try to keep the lights on however we do it right because when we gather together it's it's stronger without a doubt but uh, i love that last one because it's the dog knew when the guy was going to pass and came to usher him over that's my belief anyway and how many stories have we heard like that that loyalty Rob Guthrie's come in here and said it. Kathy McCarthy's come in here and said it. Countless medium friends that have come on and done the show have all told us that they have it so, they're so much more concerned with us and they have so little barrier back and forth, you know, that they care more how we're doing, how we are, than how they are. And they don't have any problem. They're chill. They're chill. I mean, they go right over, everything gets fixed, they're, they're walking again. Some of the best, you know, stories you hear is how animals were, you know, uh, limping or whatever it may be. God bless them. And they cross over, but they come back and they're not doing that anymore. And they try to show us when they're walking down the hall, you don't hear that, you hear that click, 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 not the click, hop, click, you know, that you were used to because it was a little harder for them to move that leg or Whatever it may be, everybody knows what I'm talking about. German shepherds and hip dysplasia, the whole shebang, these poor things. Anyhow, they find a way to show us that we may not recognize it. We may not understand it. We may not see it at the time. Does this resonate with anybody? It's like we hear it and we focus on, is that the clapping? Oh, you know, or that's the jingle of the collar. And they're still telling us a whole thing. Okay, here's real quick. I'll explain what I mean. My heart broke when Mario lost his cat, Simon. Simon was a great cat. And it just so happened that I was the one there. I was the one that followed through and was there for him, the whole thing. He always came up on the bed a certain way. Every night. You know what I mean. We all have animals that do that. Repetitive. Have a routine. 
when he was get up on the bed toward the end there before he passed, he would limp because of his hip. He passed the second, I want to say first or second night. It was real soon. I felt the jump. But he was walking on all fours. And I remember very nonchalantly just kind of leaning back and throwing my energy that way and saying, okay, buddy, but he's going to be fine. Don't stay for him. You go get your, you know, you're going back over and chase butterflies. You know, I'll take care of him. And we, and you could feel the, the energy exchange of calm and everybody was chill. You know, it was like, okay, everything was understood. And I do believe in a lot of cases it can be that, as as Lindsay pointed out and others in the chat too, matter of fact, that it's just that way. It is what it is. It is what it is. And so many people have tried to tell us it's not true or we're crazy for believing it or we're crazy for seeing it or we didn't see what we saw. We don't understand what we understand. We don't know things, but we're at a point in each one of our own individual ways and experiences at a certain point of again you know we're way past certain stuff do ghosts exist well come on there's so much like the lady said earlier in this story so much goes on and we hear so many stories that surely we can't just you know poo poo it all together right so let's do this this last one and then i got a surprise for you here at the uh from 1975 Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. We spend almost a third of our lives asleep and dreaming, a strange and still largely unexplained condition, and occasionally dreams and ghosts seem to intermingle and overlap in a disconcerting fashion. Sir Harold Bolton, who wrote the Sky Boat Song, always vouched for the authenticity of a very strange story. I hate to stop it there, but is that the, is that the theme from uh, Outlander? Is it? I bet it is. I bet money on it. I'm going to play it again. One second. Listen right here. Sorry, guys. It's, it's going to eat at me if I don't if I don't figure it out. Dreams and ghosts seem to intermingle and overlap That's in it. a disconcerting fashion. Sir Harold Bolton, who wrote the Sam Sky Hansen? Boat Song, always vouched for the authenticity of a very strange story. When he was a boy, Harold's mother had a recurring dream of a house set in beautiful gardens. Inside, the decoration and the contents were of the finest quality. She spoke of her dream often, and after a while seemed to know every corner of the house. However, gradually the dream became less frequent and finally ceased altogether. And here my tale would end were it not for a strange coincidence. Some years later, Sir Harold bought Ballyhoolish House in Scotland. His mother was to live with him, and he took her up to see the property. But she had already seen it. In fact, she knew it like the back of her hand. The Ballyhoolish House was the house of her dreams. The former owner, Lady Beresford, showed them round, and Mrs Bolton then discovered several things were different. She asked about a fireplace, a window, a doorway, and in every case Lady Beresford said, Oh yes, it used to be like that, but we altered it. But the strangest thing of all happened as they were about to leave. Lady Beresford took Mrs Bolton on one side and said, My dear, you won't mind me mentioning it, will you? But you're the ghostly little lady that used to haunt Ballyhoolish House some years ago. I heard this tale from Alistair MacGregor, former secretary to the Duchy of Lancaster, who knew the Boltons, and Ballyhoolish House stands to this day. I'm Peter Underwood, and I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Boom! Did you hear that? How many stories does that hook up with that we've told gatekeepers over the years, sitting here going over stories and witness eyewitness um, retellings and all that, where the house drew them to it, 
and some some lean toward reincarnation some lean toward this type of thing where the person is dreaming about a house and then they go and they they go to a house they go down the road and all of a sudden that's it and the house is up for sale very much again like um uh oh what was his name from um uh, the demon of brownsville road his name is gone but you know who i mean he was drawn to that house from a kid from being a kid and aj on here we were talking about it and he said he didn't know whether he believed in all that art reincarnation stuff and again your your whatever your vantage point is wherever you're at at the time there's nothing there's no right or wrong in in adding things on and, and accepting things as a whole that it's all connected and there's more possibilities than we're even scratching on at this point you know what i mean portals and things coming in and out and doing this and this changing and dimensions and it's like yeehaw it's a party now right so we're just talking about a tiny little piece of this that it's quite possible that we're kind of recycled and some of us chose to be here now and picked it and we were probably cocky about it on the other side because we were just like hey you know i'm i'm in kind of like <laughs> what's that scene from hold on young guns might have been young guns too because it, the scene i believe was them around a campfire with tall weeds in the background about to do something really stupid but kind of cool if you like that kind of thing it's cowboys so it's allowed and it was they were saying, I think it was the first one, because they were going to go into town and they were going to get the girl. Yeah, was it the China girl? That's two, right? Anyway, they were going to go fight the whole town, you know, outnumbered, outgunned. They are going to pull off something crazy. This is the spirit world. See, size that chicken? <laughs> oh, God, young guns and all. Yeah, it's good stuff. But he says... We're going to go in and we're going to do all this stuff. And it's do, it's uh, um, Kiefer Sutherland and, and you know, and uh, Navio, <laughs> Mexican Greaser. Remember? And they had this big, ugly plan, you know, this unbelievable plan. Everything was against them and they were going to do it. They almost got away with it, too. And he said, that's the test of all tests. You know, if you ask me, I'm in. I'm in. It's like that t-shirt says, you know, it's Friday. Sounds crazy. Let's do, when does it start? You know, that's an, let's not do that. It sounds dangerous and crazy and stupid. When do we start? Mm -hmm. There you go. Thank you on common. I appreciate that. That sounds like the test of all tests. If you ask me, I'm in. Thank you very much. That's exactly right. Sounds like test of all tests. Yes. What'd you kill him for, Billy? Hacking on me. So anyway, back to Peter Underwood. The thing is, is of course, you know, everybody has a vantage point and belief and you, you sort it and you talk about it and you, there's just too much. And that's nothing against anybody that doesn't believe or doesn't see that in their 40,000 foot view yet. Because I can speak from experience saying I can look back and when I went, no, nah, on a lot of things that I'm going, yup, now. Without hesitation, like, oh, yeah, that's nothing. Wait to hear this. You see what I mean? We've all been, a lot of us have been there. And there's, there's too much of this where there's a place calling somebody, the house is drawing them to it. It can get into, to an obsessive point where the house won't let them go kind of thing. And they're ignoring it. It's almost like a, um, something that's possessed the house, almost like an old couch you get at the thrift store or the, the you know haunted china cabinet or whatever. The door is always banging. You see people in the glass and stuff like that. You know, as you walk by, that's creepy. I would put that in a book. Somebody write that down. It's creepy, right? It's got its moments. It can, it can, it can be done good. So anyhow, 
I, I just think this is another one. And Peter Underwood is also the one that told the story that I shared with you guys a long time ago. Because he's got a bunch of these. And he tells the story of the guy who has the intuition. All right. So I can't remember the whole thing exact. Forgive me because I'm pulling it way out of the, it's got dust on it. All right. So he, he, he goes, it's a fancy hotel where it has like the old ballroom and the real nice restaurant. You know, this is in uh, London, I believe it's close to it. And he goes in and he gets a premonition not to get on the elevator. Everybody's going up and he's going to go up to his room and he's a real busy businessman. And this is back in the day. He goes to get on the elevator and he stops himself. And of course the elevator unfortunately crashes and most of the people are really badly hurt or they passed. And he gets all creeped out about it and stuff like that. And he, he is such the, he would see the people from the elevator and it just, it just goes on and on and on. But the big thing was he kept getting intuition until he started being haunted by these things and it kind of drove him crazy and he wound up not ending too well. I'll find it and I'll play it for you. Peter tells it better. I just can't remember. So anyway, th there's so many different things that his ghost stories touch on that really gives you a great like spice rack full of all kinds of different paranormal experiences. It's reincarnation. It's houses calling people, people dreaming of a house and the people there that own the house say the lady that's been having these dreams is the one haunting the place. That's next level. And there's multiple stories like that. Not just the house drawing this person. That's that's a whole nother. That's all the category. But this is different. And they're seeing her as a ghost. This is like the others. Where the ghosts think that the living are the ghosts. And it gives you this whole different vantage point and perspective on it. It's just very interesting. And it's a lot of his stories have a lot of that next level flavor to it, you know, where it's not just your average ghost story that you're going to, you know, the, you know, I was brushing my teeth and the thing jumped out of the, you know, whatever, and the three, three scratches and whatever we had to move and it followed me as creepy as that is. You know, there's more, there's a little bit more substance in different ways, not to take away from the other one, but uh, it really expands your, your library. Let's put it that way. All right. Last one. This is my favorite one. Ghost watch. A few years ago, I spent a night at Newark Park in Gloucestershire. A house where strange rustling sounds, as though a person dressed in trading clothes was moving around, had been reported many times. Fearful visitors had also heard disembodied voices. Clear and distinct footsteps echoed along deserted passageways. The sound of rattling chains was reported, and there was talk of an unnatural coldness. I had gone there with other investigators to ghost watch. That first night we concentrated on a staircase landing where the rustling and voices had been heard from time to time for over 70 years. In half an hour, four members of our team heard it. We waited for voices, but no luck. We decided to sit again in the same place and this time take with us recording equipment together with a camera loaded with infrared film that takes photographs in darkness. We hoped that even if we saw nothing, the camera might pick up whatever might be there. The recorder was running, the camera ready, but we heard nothing. The next day we ran the tape through, just in case the recorder had picked up anything we hadn't heard. There were two faint but distinct voices on the tape. 
A man's voice said, it's looking. And a woman's, it's looking at us. Could they have been talking about the camera lens pointing at them? It's a pity we didn't take any pictures. Those voices remain a mystery and a lasting reminder of our ghost hunt in the Cotswolds. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Borley Rectory in Essex, which was built in 1863, was known as the most haunted house in England until it was destroyed by fire in 1938. Every single person who ever lived in this rambling red brick property asserted that they heard, saw and experienced ghostly happenings. There were dozens of ghostly sightings of a ghost nun and a coach and horses. A nun had, apparently, been caught eloping with a brother from a nearby monastery in the 17th century. They were chased and caught. The brother was hanged and the nun bricked up alive. Was it she who haunted the rectory? As I said, each person who lived at Borley talked of a ghostly experience. And one sighting of the nun was by four sisters who were returning from a garden party one July afternoon. They all saw her from different vantage points in the garden at the same time. A later rector at Borley poured scorn upon the ghosts, saying it was pointless wandering about aimlessly, making footsteps and other noises and moving objects about. After he died, he said, he would try to reappear with a positive action, like throwing mothballs about, so that those alive would know that it were he. How is that a positive ac action? Surely he means something that can't be um, debunked, if you want to use that word. You know what I mean? Disproven or whatever. But the way he says it sounds so funny. Twenty years later, the rector, long dead and buried, the house was empty and was in fact the subject of a scientific study of the supernatural. One day, a party of investigators arrived at the house when they opened the door, they were greeted by a hail of mothballs. Even after the rectory was burnt to the ground, the site was repeatedly reported to be haunted by the ghost of the restless, tragic young nun. Now that there, I wanted to show you this, it's so cool. From 1880, this is the first Ghost Club album. This is a club that goes back now there's controversy on if it continued without ceasing since 1880 and you get that kind of you know my bigfoot's bigger than your dog man kind of crap going on where people are arguing about stuff the point is they started in 1880 you know if they missed a couple meetings well so be it and they continued the quest to understand the afterlife, the other side, ghostly happenings, history, research, and investigation. And they used what they had, and they came up with some gadgets. I give you Harry Price and peter underwood and so many of the people like him and you're going to meet some before we go tonight you're going to see i'm gonna it's a treat anyway and they were doing it and they were journalizing this and they were taking down evidence and they were writing the stories and they were telling the tales and they were standing around whether it was at their men's club with their cigars and their proper cup of tea you know, if it was, you know, and I got, I have nothing but respect for that because when you see around them in a lot of the movies, of course, I've never been in one or at one, but in all the movies, you see all these books and you think in all that knowledge, you know, if they ever pulled one down, you know, one of those down and, and really dug into it. They had the time then. They made the time. They educated themselves in so many ways. So, of course, they went after this subject with all they had. And they spoke of it 
in circles sometimes because none of them wanted to commit to being the crazy one in the room and say a fraction of what we say all the time every Sunday or you guys were on your podcast and on your, you know, in your books, you authors out there and retelling of your tales and coming here to learn and, and teach me and teaching and learning from each other and learning from people like this, man. So if you hear about that, think back. This ghost club was since 1880. And they had to have come up with something along the way. Is there anything we can glean from that that helps us in our investigations today? Even how they used, it's not very different, the equipment that they used. Of course, the high-tech stuff, that goes without saying. But really, we're dealing with the same type of ghosts. The ghosts haven't gotten any more high-tech, have they? Or do you think they may have? It's us that are changing adding on more stuff, more equipment, more thought, more trial and error, trying to communicate with them and trying to be able to prove it more. Right? So we can share with other people. Of course, you're not just, there's very, I think there's probably very little, a few people that go out to investigate that don't share with somebody what their findings or no findings were. You know, they're either doing it for a blog or a video or research or a study or in a group. I, you know, I'm not saying there's not solo people out there. I'm saying that now we can share and probably don't think twice about going down to the local bar and walking in and having people, hey, did you see Bigfoot this weekend? Did you catch anything in the woods? Did you catch a ghost or whatever? You see what I mean? So thinking back on the ghost club, a lot of people get caught up in this whole, my ghost club's older than yours. Well, really nothing holds a candle to this. And he was the president for quite a few decades. So again, I say, look at all those books. I guarantee you there's some knowledge in there that if you're interested you could probably get a lot from it. And he's overlooked an awful lot. And even Harry Price is overlooked a lot. And all you hear about are the gimmicks and the, the things and the toys. And, you know, I showed the picture here. I think it's right after this. Yep, 1980s, BBC Radio. This stuff, look it up. There's a lot of it out there on the net for free. And there's a lot of... Uh, his interviews as well, like I said. So, um, gosh, look at that house. Would you live there? In a heartbeat, right? In an absolute heartbeat. Okay. It'd be hard to keep, but you could figure it out. Good old good old wood, just like, grand, you know, our great-grandparents and everybody else did, right? Okay, so this next part real quick here is a treat. Now, I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's, I've already rattled on my mouth. I have to share it. 1975 the ghost hunters now here's some of the equipment this isn't uh, this one's not necessarily uh peter underwoods but it's of uh the ghost hunters and you can look through there and see some of the things they had i mean they've got an old bell the kind that you 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 clank you know and it and it makes the bell ring like an old school bell but smaller They've got all kinds of stuff here, but it's simple things. It's a, a their version of the camera and the even looks up here uh, like an old movie camera, right? So not much different. It's things that light up flat, they, what they would call a torch and simple things like flower on the floor, um, flower on the table to see if anybody's touching it. Is it moving on its own or different things like that? They were very into debunking and trying to get rid of, wade through the charlatans and people that were given all this a bad name, whether it be seances or mediums or psychics or 
tarot readers or fortune tellers, whatever you want to call that whole genre, trying to disprove because they were coming out of this era, you know, your Houdini, same thing, trying to debunk the magic tricks that some people were pulling and really exploiting the grief of people that were missing loved ones and just looking for answers and help, right? They were part of that. They were part of dispelling that kind of stuff. But they were also very into, and I would have loved to see more. You see some of it here. Seen more of. Um, Start token, please. We'll go to the alphabet A, B, C, D. This kind of stuff. A, B, C, D. The ghost hunters. B. This is before the boys got in there and had their TV show. You know, let that be as it is. This is the Ghost Hunters, 1975. You're going to meet some characters. But here's the thing. 1975, UK. You know, if we the clothes are going to look funny. The hairstyles are going to look funny. The mannerisms might be, you know, uh, whatever. But the thing is, is these are people that are serious, just like table tipping or anything else was going on at the same time here where I was with, like I said before, Hans Hosler, it's incredible to me how we're still, this is 1975, all that was going on then, Amityville, all of this, Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby was going on here. I don't know what was playing in Australia or, or around. I'm sure those Jaws and everything made its rounds, right? But we're still doing the same thing. Just like Bigfoot, you know, we're all still doing the same thing, looking for, I think, answers to similar questions, right? It's mind-blowing. But this is fun. I'll jump through some of the boring stuff so we can get to the, the end, so I don't want to keep you guys too long. But I just thought it would be fun to visit, okay? F. G. Um... Let's see, just up G. Will you please rock twice for yes and once for no? Is it G? Rock twice for yes and once for no, please. Is it G, the first letter, please? Once, twice. Okay, next up the second uh, second letter, please. Start spelling. E. He's e. the main guy trying to figure out what's going on. He's the one of the news channel. Could it be A? Is it A? News Will channel? you please rock twice if it's A? Need to stop now. Who are you talking to, Mr. Herbert? Uh, well, we don't know, do we? Uh, but uh, but no, you only want uh, what, uh, one of our subconscious minds, one no. of us. <laughs> no. Or maybe all of us, I don't know. No. Um, anyway, this is not a, a specialist demonstration, it's just scientific. A. This is true. C. D. E. F. G. H. Some strange goings on have been reported from a pub in Wiltshire. And the widely travelled ghost hunter, Mr. Benson, has come to investigate. We've got a couple of fireplaces here. They're all right. They couldn't produce any odd sounds, I suppose. Was there much wind these nights, or these days? The days? No, it's quite a quiet day. The first day what, we ever What heard time this. of the year? Um, it must have been late summer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I suppose a, a mouse, a mouse on the piano. 1975, Zach Baggins. Going in there goes, oh, that's it. There's a, there's a demon right here in this cupboard. Was a wind was a wind that night? No, then it must be it's a demon. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have said that. <laughs> Y'all with me though, aren't you? I know, couldn't um, make no, not, not, not footsteps across. <laughs> do, do you do we get floor. mice in the place much? In the uh, side not of the not mice? in the building. We found some in the outhouses, but not in the building. Not actually in the building. Uh huh. And it's all carefully locked up, and you've got no had no sign of intruders. Well, the first time this happened uh, was on a Thursday morning. Liz yeah. was at the cash and carry, and uh, I was sitting downstairs doing some work, and I heard these footsteps go across this clubroom floor. I went, came all the way up mm -hmm. the communicating door to the uh, bedroom and uh, clubroom was closed, bolted from the bedroom side. The doors to the outside stairs were also um, 
closed. I, went, I opened them, I even looked down the stairs in case someone was walking up and down the stairs, but there was nothing at all. <laughs> so there seem to be two kinds of poltergeist. One is uh, uh, associated with a place, a place located poltergeist, and the other the person, a person located poltergeist, which follows the person around if they move. So uh, the next question is, uh, what about before you came here, did you, in your previous place, did you ever get any odd... Uh, in, yes. in our previous place, yes. uh, in our own home, mm -hmm. yes. uh, my oh, wife maybe will tell you something about yes. this. Could you? We had a bedroom. Well, we had, well, we've still got the house, actually. Well, actually, you know more about it than I do, because somebody mm. died, one of your relations died in that room, but I didn't know this. I, I didn't know it at all. And I never liked that bedroom. I couldn't stand it, and, and my young daughter didn't like it either. She didn't like being alone in the house, and she was... 12 years old. I mean, this she was no baby. Is the theory, Mr. Herbert, that the ghosts go with uh, people uh, rather than... Yes. A place, uh, place, it's a person located in uh, Pontigas. Uh, due to her own uh, unconscious powers of, uh, of uh, affecting matter around her, making noise or movements, you had a movement, didn't you? Something moved off a bath or something. Uh, yes. This was a funny, again, a funny incident. We were... Um... You know what's funny? I don't know who Sarasota Tim is. So, you know, what's funny is the verbiage, poltergeist. He's saying the daughter, also, you know, PK, they're already, they're talking about that, but it, the way they're throwing it out there and jumping around is kind of unnerving to me. I'm sure they're doing for the cameras. They're trying to speed through stories and things. I'm sure this isn't an exact reenactment of a of an investigation, or maybe it is. I don't, you know, I shouldn't say I know because I don't. But um, it's so it's funny to me how he just jumps to that. But it's also cool that he mentions it, knowing that they're studying this back then. Now think again. This is time of the entity and um, the Barry Taft, that whole thing. Um, Roy. Uh, Lloyd Auer, I, I can't say his name, Auerbach, all of these people are running around. The parapsychology was big, and apparently it was big there, too. And I'm wondering what other countries is just really, really big. And, of course, I, I knew it was going to be in the U.K. But Australia, did, did people in Australia in the, in the 70s, were they into the paranormal stuff? It was just something that you told around, like, in the fall or in your Halloween or whatever, or do you even think about stuff like that? Did you have who had ghost stories of Christmas Eve was UK? Because he told about that's the whole Charles Dickens thing, that whole reason the Christmas Carol came up. So an old Victorian here. I know they told ghost stories. You know, around, we're more famous for telling ghost stories around a campfire, you know. But I think they did that everywhere, didn't they? Even in, like, Vikings and, am I wrong? You know? So, here, they're already on to, hold on a minute, your daughter could be, you know, sending off energies and moving things around by herself. You know? And even now, I know a lot of really good paranormal investigators, they go through and they make you answer questions and go through stuff to make sure it's not something like this. I, I found that interesting. Uh, cool. One day we were standing there, it had fallen down. I said, Liz, there must be something causing this. And she said, it's our poltergeist. So I said, uh, well, if there's someone here, show yourself. And just then, from a chair that was standing, I suppose, five, six feet away from us, fell a bathroom. A bath rack. Uh, no one pushed it, no one jumped or anything like that. It just fell off. I could say it jumped off, but I, I, I'm prepared to say it fell off. Uh -huh. yeah, how can she, <laughs> she make that fall off the wall? Well, by what we call psychokinesis, there's, uh, uh, for example, there's a woman in Leningrad, Madame Kulagina, who can move objects by winning them. I've done experiments with her well, this is doing it many well, times, and uh, she d doesn't realize she's doing it, but uh, presumably somehow she's doing it. This is theory or fact? Well, uh, well there's, there's a lot of uh, data to uh, to verify this idea. It's not my idea. It's uh, a general consensus of opinion among parapsychologists all over the world uh, uh, agrees with this idea. And so you, you would call this telekinesis if she's not aware of it, and psychokinesis if she is aware of it. 
So, now, Mr. Herbert, are you investigating Liz, or are you investigating the pub? Well, uh, I could, of course, um, put her through some psychic tests to see if she has psychic powers, but uh, um, this is not quite the appropriate moment. I haven't got all the apparatus ready just here. Uh, instead, I will probably just investigate in the room as a, as a physical uh, environment. And uh, we have here some sample apparatus, the kind of thing, a small uh, sample of the kind of apparatus I usually use, uh, for a preliminary investigation. Uh, my assistants, uh, Vicky and uh, Rich, uh, helped me with the setting up. Uh, th this is a ne negative iron pistol. Uh, if, um, uh, if Vicky will come here, I'll just demonstrate to This blew my mind. Your mouth. I I'm going to fire negative ions into your mouth. Now I'm firing. Now you can close your mouth. Now I turn it away, and I slowly release the trigger, uh, and the positive ions are harmlessly going in this direction. But what does that mean? I mean, positive ions, negative ions. What are you talking uh, well, about? Well, negatively charged uh, air, which are very good for the human organism, and um, make you more alert. For example, the, there's some French airlines that use this kind of thing for their, uh, for their pilots on long-distance flights. It keeps them more alert. Uh, I myself find, uh, usually, uh, without this, I could perhaps keep on working or writing an article at 2 a.m. With it, I can go on to about 4 a.m. without any fatigue, you see. And um, so this helps for the spooky atmosphere. Now, while... Uh, Why Vicky's do you keep referring to a spooky atmosphere? Because it sounds a bit sort we, of stagey. We are, we are trying to incite the poltergeist. There's uh, some kind of poltergeist. You know, it's difficult to get these to happen just when you want them, especially when people interview you with cameras. So, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So we try to bring it on, if possible, mm. uh, for the benefit of the cameras. We hope something might happen. It may not, I don't know. And uh, while Vicky is setting that up, um, Reg is uh, fitting up an infrared detector. Uh, this, if it's properly fixed up, can detect the heat of a candle a quarter of a mile away. But uh, we a don't... A quarter of a mile away? Yes, yes. Are you serious? Oh, yes. This kind of thing is used by uh, astronomers for uh, detecting uh, heat from stellar bodies. Uh, many people in haunted houses claim that the, uh, the temperature goes down before something happens, it get, uh, gets cold, the field shivery, and um, we've discovered that it is a real drop in temperature, it's not just imagination. Mm. And the third bit of apparatus is this uh, electrostatic meter, which detects uh, changes in the electrostatic field. Now, if I, uh, if you put, put it down here, I just clip this on, you can erect this any convenient part, say, in a corridor along which a ghost is supposed mm. to be walking, and when I press this, the uh, needle flickers right over, showing this is pistol is working, you say. Mm. I'll, I'll now centralize the needle, and um, when I press it, it'll go to the right, and then when I leave go, it'll go the other way, as you see, and slowly come back to normal. And so if that changes for no reason, one, uh, one may assume, possibly, that there's something odd happening, like the poltergeist. You've travelled all over Europe, Mr. Benson Herbert, with, with this apparatus that here. Uh, well, yes, with more sophisticated apparatus than this, actually. And what uh, do you think Eastern here? West Europe. What do you think uh, from what you what you've seen there? Do you think that house is haunted, or do you think it's her? Uh, well, I think there's um, probably something odd about the house, which this uh, lady Liz is triggering off. But you will have to investigate for a longer period of time, three or four months, at Sanford Orchestra was there for two or three years, for instance. Uh, one would need at least two or three months to be sure of that there's something rather odd happening, you know? Why is Amazon... Sorry, guys. So the thing is, is... They're pretty much doing similar things. I was surprised at the whole negative ions thing and all that, but again, something different. I don't know. Are groups out there doing this? I'm no expert. But some of the things he was using were trying to get similar results. Peter Underwood was very big in uh, taping, recording things course through the decades things became more available and he incorporated them and you heard that in the stories that he was telling a couple of them he he mentioned that 
and he was getting things like footsteps. Now, I'm going to fast forward this one. I wanted to show you that guy because, again, this was an older man that was in the ghost hunting club that Peter Underwood was president of. And it was just a small branch out checking out a small pub. But I left all that in there because it was interesting that they were so on the whole PK thing. They were willing to look at it separately. They were going to spend two to three months investigating this place and were very reluctant just like now, to jump to conclusions, right? And again, you don't see a lot of psychics on the grounds telling you about what they're seeing and feeling. And um, I would say that at the time, both sides were, were very open to that because here... In America, I can attest that people like Hans Holzler and Ethel Myers and Sybil Leake, many people, many investigation groups were going that route and using mediums and just like true crime, finding bodies, the missing and everything else. They were, it was going on and I believe very much so in the UK as well. They these guys were more. I don't want to say that they didn't use that or they weren't involved in that, but what they perceived to the public and probably in their meetings, it was more science than feeling. But as I watched Peter Underwood looking sprinkled through his decades. He seemed to add more to that. More a bit people with abilities being included in the evidence and the pre presentation of his stories and in his books. And I think the one that did it was... Fine. Interesting little documentary. That whole documentary is on um, YouTube. I believe Daily Motion. This guy. Oh my gosh. And um, somewhere else, I think, you know, but the whole documentary is worth watching. It's called The Ghost Hunters. 1975 put that in it should pop up there's a couple of people in there taking you through their haunted house and what i thought was interesting was it seemed like they were taking a small class through there like fourth fifth grade something like that these young kids and the guy was telling them the historicals you know the the story and the people that lived there and how we found uh he even put, at one point pulled out a oh, thought this was funny, pulled out a long knife and showed these little kids and said, and I found this in the wall when I remodeled the kitchen and they tell me that it was used to murder somebody and all the kids go, oh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, but the best part about it is they saved the best for last. And this last little bit here is, um, Peter Underwood at Borley mansion uh, at, uh, Borley rectory. And before we do that, I got a one minute trailer. I'm going to, treat y'all go find this movie if you want to see something cool now Lindsay and some of the gatekeepers are going to recognize this but it's worth seeing again the trailer if you've seen the movie tell them how good it is but uh if you like movies done in kind of like a comic booky kind of feel um it's a little of everything thrown in there this is it and if you know what I'm talking about, it's um, the 2018 movie, uh, independent movie called Borley Rectory. And I'll see if I can share that with you. Let's, fingers crossed, see if I can show you this trailer. All right. Do, 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 do. Why can't I find the thing? Hold on. Bear with me. Thank <laughs> you. 
Ghostly figures of headless coachmen, a nun believed to have been bricked up within the walls that appears and vanishes mysteriously, a screaming girl at the window of the balloon room, and dragging footsteps in empty halls. The scene of the ghostly visitations is the rectory at Borley. If any entity is present here tonight, will it please make itself known? Wow. Right? Good stuff, right? So go see that movie. There's a couple other trailers on YouTube. There's so many different effects, the way they do things. It's very cleverly done. Tells a great story of the Borley Rectory. And this is, of course, the story of... There's a lot of things that went on there, but the most famous is the poor nun that fell in love with a monk and apparently you're not supposed to do that. And uh, they wound up hanging him in the tree and walled her up, uh, buried alive. Uh, I always thought that was awful. I mean, what what's wrong with you doing stuff like this to people? Seriously. I mean, come on. And then, and I say it every time I talk about Morley, I think to myself, what what is wrong with human beings when they think that saying that they're going to prove to you a religion that is based on unconditional love <laughs> supposedly you know and their answer to two people falling in love is to hang one and wall up the other one buried alive a nun and a monk I don't understand makes as much sense as you know Burning witches alive for saving the town's children from smallpox or something. It, 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 let's learn from history, right? We all are in agreement. So um, that story, of course, is the nun haunts the place. You don't hear too much about the monk. I could be wrong. I'm no expert on the stories are, are endless in this. But I'm going to let Peter Underwood tell you. So here we go. But uh, that's not we get Peter. Other psychic phenomena. Uh, we get the smell of insane. You work to be done. You see how far in we are here. He was actually saying, kind of interesting. I don't want to let it play because it's so long. But here, here we go. So, uh, a special habit that he so feels that the most ghosts way that they identify themselves to us is to be in their own clothes. Now, where do you draw all your feelings about this from? Is it the teaching of the church? Is it the general culture of the church, of Christianity? The general culture, I suppose. But I have my own personal feelings, which I couldn't explain. But this is Britain's most remarkable haunted place, on the borders of Essex and Suffolk. In 1863, a rectory was built here, and just about every strange phenomena have been reported over the years. So, Peter Underwood, you are president of the ghost club in England, which makes you one of the leading ghost hunters. And here we are at Borley Rectory, one of the most haunted houses in the country. Is that right? Well, yes, but uh, we're not actually at Borley Rectory because Borley Rectory stood over there and is no longer there. But the, I'm quite convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that the house that stood just across the road was and fully lived up to its name as the most haunted house in England. Why? Why are you convinced? The accumulation of evidence over the years is absolutely shattering. It all began with the legend, and of course the most familiar aspect of the haunting is a ghost nun, which has been seen for something like, well, nearly a hundred years. One of the rectors even bricked up one of the windows because he said the phantom nun looked in at him having his breakfast. But over the years, 
Phantom figures have been seen. Footsteps have been heard, solid, heavy footsteps on floorboards. Messages have been scribbled on the walls and pieces of paper, apparently from a French nun asking for light mass and prayers. Bones have been found, two skulls have been found. One was buried in the churchyard, the other. Were they identified as women or female? Or? One of them was identified as a young female. And it's rather interesting because a dental surgeon discovered that there was a deep-seated abscess in the jawbone. And nearly all the people who have reported seeing the nun have said that she appeared sad-faced, unhappy. And, of course, with the deep-seated abscess, she would indeed... So, really, we're sad. talking about a, 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 the ghosts of a, a nun with toothache. That's what it sounds like, yes, yes. But putting all that on one side, the fact remains, you've got the incumbencies of four rectors from 1892, uh, from 1863 rather, until 1935, four rectors, their families, wives, many friends and relatives, all of whom assert that they heard, saw and felt things which they can't explain. And I think the cumulative evidence is absolutely overwhelming that this was indeed the most haunted house in England. It was in 1937 that when the Smiths were here, uh, Smith had recently come to England from in India and he just walked into this and he wondered what was happening. He saw a figure, he saw a phantom coach, his lights suddenly blared up, bells rang. He didn't know what to do and he wrote to a, the national paper and they sent down Harry Price, who was the leading psychic investigator at that time. And of course he was fascinated once he heard the story and started making inquiries. Uh, the ecclesiastical authorities decided that the house was no longer suitable for a rector to live in and Price decided to rent it and he rented the place for a year arranged independent investigators who again reported identical phenomena, footsteps, lights, noises, bell ringing, and so on. Uh, and then the place was sold privately to a Crackton Grigson, and while he owned it, a somewhat mysterious fire took place and the place was gutted. But the interesting thing is that once the rectory was destroyed and there was no building on the site, then the entities apparently transferred their activities to the church where visiting rectors have seen figures, have heard noises. Many visitors have reported footsteps following them up the church path inside the uh, church itself. At Epping, working on the M11 motorway extension, is one of Borley's most remarkable witnesses. Mr. Croom Hollingsworth and a team of investigators taped recordings in the church and spent many nights observing the rectory ground. I got a team together with Roy Potter and we did uh, Actually, uh, on the site of the rectory, we concentrated mostly. Have and you we've... seen anything there? Oh, yes. Uh, um, in June, I can't even mention the exact date, but in June, we sighted the nun. You did? Oh, yes, uh, two of us. What time of the day? Uh, oh, I would say somewhere about quarter to two in the morning it was. It was absolutely full moon. And uh, first of all, we couldn't, uh, you know, we couldn't really... <laughs> we were astonished. But when we saw this apparition, um, go through bushes and through railings and across a, a, a trench, we knew we were really onto something. So we had an observation actually 11 minutes and I had a... How long? 11 minutes. You 11 watched minutes. a ghost for 11 minutes? 11 minutes, exactly. Well, I wouldn't say exactly, but around about 11 minutes. 9 to 11 minutes. Now, this... Uh, I had a wonderful view of her because uh, she came towards me and then she stood still for some time and I was able to have a good look at the nun. Uh, she actually started on the original old nun's walk, which is in the back garden of some people's bungalow. And uh, she disappeared in the, the back part of their bungalow, and then she reappeared and came across into the rectory part. Actually, she finished up behind the rectory and disappeared in, the, in some shrubs there. The, the nun, oh, uh, when she's looking at you, she's not seeing you at all. She's not seeing you. Even when she was supposed to stand in the old days of Harry Price, standing looking in the rectory window, she's not seeing the rectory. She's in her own period. She's seeing something that's there in her period. And that's why she appeared about a foot from the ground, which I... She wasn't on the ground? Well, she was a foot above it. Now, this was due, I'm sure, to the original level. Uh, since then, the ground has sunk. So I would say she was at the original level in, the, in her period. It's a weird experience you're telling me about. Oh, a woman, well, a woman gliding along a foot above the ground for ten minutes. Well, it, it may seem absurd to you, but I'm going by what I saw. And uh, this, of course, has been substantiated by, uh, by my chief investigator, who is a very hard 
Eddie person doesn't believe in this type of thing. In fact, so he re reaction was to throw a brick. Throw which, a brick? Uh, yes, at her. Yes, and it went right through us. That's uh, thing to do. Well, no, I think it was a good thing to do because <laughs> it actually it actually proved uh, that, that, that it was nothing fake. Uh, actually, I got in contact with a chubby called David Ellis, who was at Cambridge University studying a scholarship in psychic research. And Ellis was that, uh, you know, he was so surprised what we were getting at Borley and uh, so thrilled. He said, well, now, uh, look, have you tried the church? Why not try and do some tape work in that church? And then we concentrated in the church and we got another person, Denny Denshin, because he was very interested in Borley and he wanted to see for himself if there was anything at Borley. And he came and he got some amazing results. So we'll go in and listen to those recordings. And a warning, do not adjust your television picture. Now, my tape recorder is done by the tomb. What, what um, family is this? This is the tomb of the Watergrave family who were associated with the area for many years. And there's a possibility that one of this family uh, is the origin of the figure who's been described as a ghost nun. How can, how can a Watergrave be a... Uh, well, the figure has been described as having a veiled headdress, and uh, it's not certain that she's a nun. Also, this um, tomb has been the scene of a number of inexplicable incidents. Uh, people have heard the sound of earth falling, of raps and taps, and even there uh, are some reports of some of the pillars a bit moving. I'm not mm. too happy about that. Well, maybe this is what we have on this tape. Uh, no, I'll play it to you now, and we'll see if um, Tomb Hollingworth got anything like you're talking about. Our investigation was to be carried out in the church, and we came armed with tape recorders. We left the two recorders running on their own inside the building. Before locking the machines in, we searched the building. This session proved to be the most exciting one, but we firmly believe we recorded the sound of a ghost stepping forward and opening something which sounds like a door. At first, we thought we'd recorded the sound of the chancel door being opened, so we investigated this possibility. But neither of these sounds in any way seems to match the ghostly one. Nothing in the vicinity of the altar that we could find could account for the strange recording. We were so intrigued by these events that we returned to the church the following Saturday and spent the entire night there. Having searched the building once more, we locked the machines in. And already, the atmosphere seemed to be changing. Two of the teens said they felt they were being watched by somebody. Now follows the most remarkable sound of all. For quite clearly, the center microphone picked up what obviously is a human sigh. After this, we decided to break the sequence of visits and to try again during summer conditions. Did you hear it? We started recording about 1 a.m. and the first tapes revealed the natural ambience of the building and nothing else. But as we entered the church, quarter two, we all felt a change in atmosphere. I had a definite tingle pulsing through my body and a feeling as though a presence were pressing against my back. And yet, there was nothing horrific about it. We felt certain, however, that this run would produce results and we were right. It's the most surprising sound we've heard to date, and we were able to locate it as originating just in front of the altar rail. It's pretty if loud, man. If anybody in this church who is trying to communicate with us, we'd be grateful if you would try and do something tonight. Perhaps you could give us some indication of how we can help you. At about 20 past three in the morning, we picked up the sound of faint rapping. The team made another random visit at the end of August. A watch was kept throughout the night on the chancel door, and this proved worthwhile, for in the small hours, a glow was observed around the door as though a phosphorescent aura were emanating. On this occasion, the church produced yet another sound. This ended with a rather more frightening sound. Yeah. 
great food. Why don't you just get chills? For the fifth visit, it was decided to keep the church mad with get chills throughout on that? the entire night. On previous occasions, we'd obtained the best results by leaving the equipment locked inside on its own. And we wondered whether the human presence might have some adverse effect on conditions. At about ten past four in the morning, three of us kept watch from a choir stall adjacent to the altar. This was to be a memorable and frightening occasion. For most of the period, there were odd clicks and taps generated in the area of the font. But as it was extremely dark, we could see nothing. Then, we began to see tiny points of light hovering on the curtain behind the font and on one of the pews about a quarter of the way down the church. At first, we thought we couldn't believe our own eyes, and each one of us thought we were suffering from fatigue until we broke the silence to speak about it. I think I'm a big tired and I keep seeing it. Jerry, are you watching pieces of the curtain light? Yes, that's what I'm seeing them. Eyes are wide. Yes, I saw one just then too. The main one is up in the curtain. Eh? On the right hand side, right in the curtain. Although we stuck our ground, there were no further audible disturbances in the church, and the lights eventually vanished. As to what they mean, is anybody's guess. But whatever they are, they are physical. The microphones prove that. Would you say that, well, as an expert, that um, these are things that are happening outside that people are observing, or that they're things that they are projecting from their own minds and think they're, they're seeing? Well, there I, I really go back to the, this atmospheric photograph theory. Mm. See, if... We, we don't, just don't know, really, but it may be that all our thoughts, no, but what do you all think? our actions mm. may be recorded on some sort of eternal tape. And under certain conditions, maybe climatic conditions, maybe in the presence of certain people, occasionally they reappear. We just don't know. That, that's I your... don't honestly think that the um, figures that are seen represent an afterlife. I think it's much more likely that it's some kind of echo of the previous life. It's a trip. Well, there you go, folks. There's some ghost hunting. There's the old equipment. This is what they used. They walked the graveyards just like us. They set all this equipment up just like us. And they tried to get evidence like that. Just like us. And that was 1975. And like I said, it, it was everywhere. And everybody in the chat who said uh, you know they want ghost stories since there was fire around the campfire since there was fire that's great i think it was jack thank you Jack. and uh, we like being scared and we're trying to understand and um uh, it's kind of it, it never gets old you always learn something and it's so interesting, like I said, everything's connected in in some way, even if it's just energetically, you know, positive to positive, negative, negative, consciousness, 
people that can see so much, you know, but their, their big picture is kind of blotchy. All, all of them are. We don't all see the big, as grand as a big picture could be. It goes on in, into infinity, right? And it's just our little puzzle piece that we're trying to, you know, and the things around us and, you know, history and wondering in, you know, wondering about the future and you're trying to make your puzzle piece fixed, you know, and some people can't see it all, all at once. That's for sure. Right. And they see one thing one way and they're, they're kind of, all right, that sort of kind of fits there. That might fit. And then you get that one piece that just changes everything. And looking back at some of the early ghost hunting and early parapsychology and even folklore and legends and stories and witness stories, everything. It's all still teachable moments. It's all still, you know, even the guy that I said was was kind of like that in 75, Zach Baggett. It was just the way he was going in there. Just imagine paranormal today overlapping with that. You know, of course, reality TV is reality TV, you know, but it still overlaps. It still kind of sort of fits. The equipment's changed and everything else. But think about it. Have the ghosts changed? Have the Bigfoot changed? Have, you know, not smarter or, or evolved. Even, you know, raccoons do that. You know, I think I'm pretty sure at this point you could show a raccoon a YouTube video on how to do something and you know, and for the right reward, they could probably figure it out. But we force that by encroaching on all of their land and forcing them to get more clever to get, you know, just to survive. And it, it, that goes for every species, including us. You know, adapt and overcome. They certainly have. So many animals have. So many trees have. Look at trees, what they'll go through to survive. Hang off a cliff, grow sideways. The flower that grows in the crack in the middle of a desert road. And you wonder how in the world. Be the flower. Um, Peter Underwood. He was worth doing an episode on. I really enjoy him. He deserved a lot better than I could do for him. You know, it's hard to get old, you know, the, the old stuff. But here's the thing. This is a story that breaches out more. If you want to focus on the man, I suggest his books again. And uh, if you want, I'll play that one more time out as we leave. Uh, because there's a lot of information in that. Uh, it's just the, the um, what, the Peter Underwood, the book list and all that stuff. So I'll play that on the way out. It's got some decent music. Um, but first... We need some kicks and some smiles, so I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, raccoon uh, advice on the way out. But thanks for spending the night with me. Sorry I went off a little bit, but seriously, folks, I understand it's it's getting it's getting tough out there. Uh, hang on, hold on, find your people. Uh, even if it's here on Sunday nights, I I, I certainly welcome you. I I thank you for being here. I know it's hard to follow sometimes, but there's so much going on. It's been a really, really a week for everybody. Prayers go out to everybody affected by any kind of um, horrific uh, things all around the world, you know. And my heart and love go and light goes out. The darker it gets, the brighter you have to get. And sometimes that's hard. So coming in here on Sunday and Monday nights with Steve Stockton and um, recharging, you know, it's it's about that. It's about finding a good conversation, a topic, learning from each other, um, you know, chatting and, and, you know, multiple layered chats going on within the chat and also people looking back at people like this. If you notice the way we started, you know, I told you at the end, he changed where he's at that 
the Borley uh, documentary and he's talking to that young man that's doing the documentary. He was a little more, I don't think there are any proof of the afterlife. But by the end of his life, he was certainly on board with um, ghosts being, I don't want to say, he said proof of, but he certainly warmed to the idea of um, ghosts having a lot more ability and a lot more credibility and people having credibility for their extra gifts. And it was, it, it was really, you know, kind of a way to watch somebody's whole life from the little boy whose job it was to describe about the haunted room and the ghosts, the family ghosts and the history and being the little showman to trying to keep his dignity and his honor and not be called crazy and keep everything extremely scientific as he's coming up into it. And then toward the latter part, becoming a great storyteller a pro prolific writer and uh, a pretty cool dude in my book. They got to do some neat things. So there you go. Yep. Much love to you, Jack. Keep your light on. And here's some raccoon friends to give us a little help. I love you all. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you. Smile as much as you can this week, folks. Dancing don't hurt. Good night, everybody. Uh -huh.